I think all of us know and are aware of the devastation and bloodshed that occurred in Israel on, on October the 7th. I, I know for me, I had a, a group of people that were getting ready to go to Israel a couple of weeks after that date. And of course, we had to uh, pull out of that trip. But the civilian population uh, was attacked there near Gaza by Hamas terrorist organization known as the Islamic Resistance Movement. Uh, this is a group that was elected by the people of Gaza since the year 2007, um, recognized as a terrorist group by the United States State Department since 1997. They, they launched this attack into Israel uh, and struck in as many as 22 locations. 300 people were brutally killed, 1,000 or 1,500 or more were, were injured, and hostages were taken. And Israel announced its response and launched an attack on Gaza. The prime minister, uh, quoting Benjamin Netanyahu, said they were to eliminate Hamas by destroying its military, its governing capabilities, and do everything possible to bring the hostages home. So October the 7th. Now Israel is still engaged, as you probably know, in this war, and many believe it will expand. And, and I think if you watch uh, what's going on, it is expanding and involving much of the Middle East in our world. The day after Christmas, Israel uh, defense minister stated that Israel was being attacked from seven different areas in the Mideast, Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, West Bank, Iraq, Yemen, and Iran. Now, now after three months of ongoing fighting and war, it's not diminishing. It continues to expand. And I would submit to you that Israel is fighting for their lives in the very existence of their nation. That's what's going on. Their enemies have declared they want to drive the Jewish people out of their land from the river to the sea. So, so today I just want to take a look at Ezekiel 38 and a brief look at 39 where God describes this condition of the world that scriptures describe as the last days or the latter days. This is not a normal type of sermon for me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more comfortable in, in a verse-by-verse -verse study of exposition of a scripture. But this is, this is more of a, a look at some of the statistics and things that are going on in the world, and especially as it relates to Israel. The Bible speaks of end times in human history. And that in the end times, it's not random, it's not out of control, but that God is sovereignly in control and has prophesied many of the things that will and are occurring. And it has to do with what God is doing and working in world history. His purpose, his plan, God's global plan. I believe the Bible teaches that God will not allow the ungodliness of mankind to go on indefinitely. The mocking of his word, the disregard for his hand of salvation and restoration, that God will rise up and put an end to it. He created heaven and earth. And whether we like it or not, Heaven and earth belongs to God. Amen. It's his. We're stewards of what God has created. We don't own the planet, and we can never disregard the owner's guidelines, desires, and his ordinances. It'd be kind of like if you purchased a ticket on a Delta flight from Pensacola to Atlanta. You're renting that seat. It doesn't belong to you. You're a guest, and so you have to abide by Delta's guidelines. When you get in, you know, the first thing they want you to do, they want you to buckle your seatbelt. If you don't buckle your seatbelt, you're not flying, dude. And your seat has to be upright for takeoff and landing. You don't light up a cigar, and you don't bring a shotgun on board. 
right? You're in Delta seat. You're renting that space. And in similar fashion, you and I are renting our space here on earth. It's his earth. It's his creation. Mankind's not the owner. He's not in charge of life here on earth. God is in charge. Amen? He has given certain guidelines and commands for us to obey. From the beginning of time, the Garden of Eden, God said, okay, here's how I'm going to lay it out. All of this you can do and this and this, but over here you can't do this. And God's response to disobedience and rejection of his word was twofold. It was correction, but it was also a hand of restoration that came seeking and saying, Adam, what have you done? Where are you? So God has his correction. He has his restoration. And when the Bible speaks of the last days, it's talking about the days right before the coming of Jesus Christ for his church and also for his millennial kingdom that will be set up. My, my understanding is there's a rapture, there's a seven-year time of tribulation, there's a second coming of Jesus Christ, there's a millennial reign. If you have a Bible there in Ezekiel chapter 38, the events of this time in Ezekiel 38 are yet to be and I believe we're perhaps living in them right now. They speak of the latter times. In fact, if you have a Bible and you're in chapter 38, right there in verse 8, it says, after many days you'll be visited in the latter years or in the latter days or in the last days. If you go over to verse 16, it speaks of the latter days again. I, I will be in the latter days or last days that I'll bring you against my land. And so Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 deal with what the Bible calls the last days and what is going to go on in Israel in the last days. Israel has always been kind of a prophetic time clock for the Lord. So, so Ezekiel, what's happening in these two chapters, await fulfillment because nothing like what is described in these chapters has ever occurred in the history of the nation of Israel. And, and so we're, we're watching what's going on. We, we're seeing what's happening there right now. In, in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now let me just ask a question. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back one day? Anybody? Okay. But you don't know the day, you don't know the hour, and we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to set a day or an hour. But we can know the signs, and we have been given prophecy. In, in 1 Thessalonians cha chapter 5, but coming concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. And, and the Bible describes certain things that will occur, and seasons and, and uh, birth pangs. And, and, and we have extensive Bible prophecy concerning the last days. Or you could use the term, instead of prophecy, history revealed in advance. So we can see things that God has revealed that will occur and not to create fear, not, not to create anxiety in a believer or, or make you frightened, but to recognize that God is in control and that he does keep his word, he does keep his promises, and prophecy should bring hope for a believer, not fear. It, it, it lets us know that God is in control of human history as his, as his word unfolds. Or I could put it like this, prophecy is a filter for watching what's going on in world events. It's a filter to, to analyze what's going on and say, oh, well, this, this seems like what's being talked about here in this passage of Scripture. Or you could say it this way, prophecy, so we can process human history as it evolves in our day. 
As we look into the book of Ezekiel, the historical context is pretty important. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit, as Ezekiel wrote, 2,600 years ago, after the southern kingdom had been defeated by Babylon and the northern kingdom by the Assyrians, Israel had been split in two. And as a nation, after Babylon and Assyria came in, Israel ceased to exist. They were without a land, they were without a home, and God had allowed Israel to be taken into captivity because of their rebellion and because of their idolatry. And they had been given many warnings, many uh, exhortations. And then in Ezekiel 36 and 37, prior to our chapters today, Ezekiel prophesied that one day they would come back into the land. That there would be a nation once again. Not, not a divided nation, no, not a southern and a northern kingdom, but one nation united as one. And so, 2,600 years later, after Ezekiel's prophecy, one of the greatest miracles of history occurred based on prophecy. May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again in human history. And this blew a lot of theo theologians' mind because a lot of people had replaced all the promises and prophecy about Israel with the church, a, a theology called replacement theology. And suddenly in 1948, Israel's back in its land. Israel's a nation again after thousands and thousands of years. And it's an amazing, miraculous fulfillment of prophecy that Israel exists today. There's never in the history of mankind been a nation that had been dispersed for over 2,000 years that maintained their own identity, their own language, their own customs, their own religion, and came back to their own land this has never happened with any other people in the entire world, but it was prophesied in the book of Ezekiel. So it's an amazing, miraculous fulfillment of prophecy that Israel exists today. I remember talking to a friend of mine once. He had kind of stepped away from his church experience, stepped away from the Lord and the scripture, and we were talking. He goes, yeah, you know, I just don't know if I believe the Bible anymore. I go, really? Well, what do you believe? Well, I just believe in the goodness and the heart of man. And I go, where is that? <laughs> I said, well, then what do you do about the prophecy of Israel coming back into their own land after being scattered for 2,000 or more years and, and being reestablished as a nation? What do you do with that? Because it's prophesied in Scripture. And he looked at me, dumbfounded, kind of, he goes, Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You forgot about that. Let's not forget about that. That's a miraculous thing that God has done. From, from chapter 40 to the end in, in Ezekiel, you have Israel's description following the second coming of Christ and setting up his millennial reign. Chapter 38 and 39 describe a military attack that will come against Israel to destroy Israel and this evasion occurs sometime when Israel had become a nation again, which is now. And the, 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 the time before us of what's going to happen in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 can be the time we live in right now. In fact, I believe the puzzle pieces have come together in a way that they've never been before that are mind-blowing to me, and it's, it's an interesting time. Look at, look at chapter 38 of Ezekiel. The word of the Lord, verse 1, came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Gog is, is a proper name of a leader, a title like president or prime minister or pharaoh or shah. Set, set, your, set your face against this leader, the land of Magog, the ancient name 
a land which today I, I, I believe, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, is possibly the nation Russia. And I say, thus says the Lord God, uh, Son of man, set your face against Gog, this leader, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy. Say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out, and will, with all your army, horses, horsemen, splendidly clothed, the great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling weapons or swords. Now, let me just say this. Ezekiel doesn't describe modern-day weaponry. He describes what he would know of in his day and his time. So a leader of a nation, ancient name, place called Magog, a land that I believe is the nation of Russia. You say, why do you believe that? Well, if you, if you look at chapter 38 and go to verse 15, he tells where Magog will come from. You will come from your place out of the far north. You and many peoples with you, all of them, horses and great company, a mighty army. And in chapter 39, verse 2, I will turn you around and lead you on, bring you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. The he Hebrew word here for far north means extreme north. And if you pull out an atlas or you pull out a globe and you look at Israel and you go as far north as you can, this giant nation exists there called what? Russia. That's what's there. And, and it, it describes him as having in verse 4, chapter 38, a great company, a splendid military, a giant power. Russia has a long time history, if you don't know this, of anti-Semitism against Israel. Even far back as 1727, a Catherine I expelled all the Jews from Russia. And on and on, anti-Semitism has been against the Jews in Russia ever, ever since then. In, in 1927, they, they were exiled. In, in 36 and 38, Stalin and what's known as the Great Purge uh, tried and murdered thousands and exiled all these Jews out of Russia. There's just this amazing long history of Russia arming Israel's enemies. 1948, when they were attacked, immediately after they became a nation, they were a part of that in 67. And then in 1973, armed by Russia, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, came against Israel and miraculously were defeated. Russia's been on the wrong side of Israel for years and years and years. And this Ezekiel war, well, it could be that God himself gives a payback where God said I will, to Abraham, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse. Some, some say, well, no, John, this, this northern uh, uh, enemy is not Russia, it's Turkey. No one knows for sure. Now, if it is Turkey, then the enemies that are mentioned in 38 and 39 would all be exclusively Islamic. And that's an obvious issue against Israel. You say, well, what is it, John? Is it, is it Israel? I mean, is it Russia or is it Turkey? I'm not sure, but if it's Russia, the purpose, the motivation is not religion, as it would be for Turkey. Russia... Gog, this leader of Magog, comes, it says in verse 12 of chapter 38, gathered against from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods to dwell in the midst of the land, that, that they're there to take plunder, to take booty, to, to stretch out a hand against the waste places that are inhabited. They, 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 they come for the resources, for the oil, for, for the natural gas, for the minerals, perhaps in the Dead Sea, and... and, and Turkey also has a strong uh, military power, if it would be them. They're the 11th ranked world power. 
three quarters of a million soldiers and weapons. But I believe in, in chapter 38, verse 6, it says, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. So, so you've got the far north and Togarma, and Togarma has been defined over and over again as the area of Turkey. So it's perhaps Russia and Turkey and other nations involved. Look at verse 3 again of chapter 38 of Ezekiel. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws, lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, and all splendidly clothed, a great company, a huge, huge confederacy of military coming against Israel with allies it tells us there in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, all its troops, the house of Tugmara, as far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Persia, which is obviously well known as Iran, ancient name, and doesn't mean that everyone in Iran are terrorists or bad. We, don't, we, we make a distinction between the government of Iran and the people of Iran, right? I mean, not that there's any difference between the government of the U.S. and the people in the U.S. I mean, we're all on the same boat, right? <laughs> but, but as you listen to the news about Iran... And their, their, their goal, their desire to develop nuclear power, and, and also known as the top terrorist nation in the world, Iran is. Ezekiel says, and I want you to listen to this part, I'll put a hook in your mouth, Magog, your jaw, and, and draw you down. The Lord is involved in drawing this far north nation into this conflict. Russia, perhaps, Magog. Not, not looking for war, but drawn into it by some incident. And Russia has strong ties with Islamic nations, very supportive of them. And the possible scenario that, that I see that makes sense is this. The, the current relationship that, that has formed economically and militarily with Russia and Iran, the event could be something like this. Israel makes a strike against Iran's nuclear facility as they're desiring to build nuclear weapons. And they make this strike. Israel knows that Iran has constantly declared that Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth. You guys know that, right? Iran's been saying that forever. And I believe as soon as they are able to develop a nuclear power, they'll come against Israel. And, and what could happen is that Israel could have a preventive strike against Iran to take out their nuclear facility where they're trying to develop this power. And Russia could come to Iran's defense and be a motivation for them to evade, invade Israel. Israel has been now speaking very openly over and over again about never allowing Iran to develop nuclear war because they've said over and over again they need to, Israel needs to be wiped off the face of the earth. And this rhetoric, you've probably heard, I certainly have, that Israel and the war against Israel, even what has happened, and this is a major issue that's going on right now, that the only way that it'll cease, and this is coming from Israel, is by taking off the head of the snake, which Israel describes as Iran. So Russia, Iran, Gog, Tagmara, the October 7th event, which has created a, 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 a reason to stabilize its borders, to wipe Hamas and Hezbollah and Lebanon, the October 7th attack, many have said, 
perhaps could be a way that these terrorist organizations are trying to occupy Israel's military while Iran continues to develop their nuclear power. But the Jewish leaders, I said it over and I'll say it again, will no way allow Iran to become a nuclear power. Listen, that's the world we're living in right now. That, that's the kind of sword rattling that's going on. Lebanon, Gaza, Hamas, Hezbollah are for the most part proxy wars fought by Iran through these terrorist organizations on the Israel border. It's insane. Israel recently took out a top Iranian revolutionary leader in Syria. Iran responded by saying this about Israel, that Israel is a savage Zionist regime and that they will pay dearly for this crime. Israel also took out some high terrorist leaders in, in, in 11 of, of these terrorist leaders in an airstrike in the Damascus International Airport. Th things are just heating up. Uh, things are extremely tense and escalating in, in the Mideast. Monday, a South Lebanon Hezbollah leader was in his car, and he was taken out by a missile. Th this, was, this was Monday, most likely coming from a drone. He's just cruising along. All of a sudden, he's gone. Now, in this prophecy about those who join Magog, we have in verse 5, Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, or Kush, which is northern Sudan, Libya, which has been rebuilt by Iran and Russia. Verse 6, it talks about Gomer and Tagmar, modern-day central or western Turkey. Turkey, a Muslim nation with, with great relationships with Russia and Iran, and openly hostile to Israel. The leader of Turkey, Turkey recently descri described the prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. He said, because of what's going on in the border skirmish war, he said that um, Benjamin Netanyahu is worse than Adolf Hitler ever thought of being. Now, that's probably the most devastating insult you could give to a Jew that you could possibly give. A lot of what we see here in Ezekiel chapter 38 seems to be coming together. These allies united. Now listen to this. These allies united in their Islamic faith, in their hatred of Israel. And, and this is prophesied. This in Ezekiel is prophesied 2,000 years before Islam even existed. Ancient people would read this and go, now how in the world could these, what would cause these people to be united together? What would put them on the same page to come against Israel? There was no idea in the original readers of this that Islam would come into focus in the 7th century and become the common factor that would bring them all together and that Russia would become connected also. Magog being Russia instead of Turkey is described with a different identity in verse 6 coming with Gomer and Tagmar into Israel to attack. A nation from the north with its own identity separate from Gomer and Tagmar. So, so that's why many believe it's Russia. And there are also those nations which are not mentioned as coming against Israel joining this fight. In verse 13, it talks about Sheba and Dedan. They don't participate. That's modern Saudi Arabia. Even though they're Muslim, they don't support Iran and the terrorism of Iran. They're, they're, they're opposed to it. Tarshish, merchants refer to descendants that settled in Greece and possibly Europe. They, they're not involved. No, no mention of Egypt which has been a long time issue, but they have, they have a, currently a, a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. Jordan, not mentioned, right there on the border. Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel. Syria, not mentioned. They, they've been in uh, uh, 13 years of civil war among themselves. They're, they're not going to jump in this. Iraq, not involved. Deep distrust of Iraq with Iran. 
Also, they've been involved in their own civil war from 212 to 218, and, and ISIS came in. You probably know that whole story, and they've been shaken and war-torn. I, I, I don't think Iraq's involved. It's interesting they're not mentioned. And you look at this prophecy, and you look at who's involved and, and how they're connected and what could happen. It's like a, it's like a puzzle that almost perfectly fits the scenario of what's going on in our world and in the Mideast today. All the pieces coming together in alignment. And listen, that has never been this way before. It's amazing. In chapter 38, verse 7, prepare yourself. Be ready, you, and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you'll be visited in the latter days. You will come into the land that those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, and your troops and many people with you. A surprise attack that comes upon Israel. And it tells us, the reason to take plunder, verse 12, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places. But God, God responds to this attack. Look at verse 14 of chapter 38. Therefore, son of man, prophesy. Say to God, thus says the Lord, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? That you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples, with all them riding horses and great company and mighty army. You'll come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. And I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I'm hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, our, our are you he of whom I've spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass, verse 18, at the same time when you come against my land, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So, so when, when they come against Israel at that time. God will cause a great earthquake in the land of Israel. A massive catastrophe occurs. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth. This, this earthquake occurs. And it says something interesting here in verse 21. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. This massive catastrophe, this earthquake, this, this hysteria will occur, and, and some will want to pull out, and some will not want them to pull out. And, and it seems that, that in the confusion, they turn against each other. It's confusion and chaos, like what happens during a massive earthquake in any country or any situation. And I will bring him judgment, verse 22. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will rain down on him, on his troops and on many peoples who are with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. God creates this earthquake and all this massive kind of chaos with weather. Thus I will magnify, verse 23, myself and sanctify myself. And it will be known in the eyes of many nations. I would submit the world will be watching. And they shall know what? That I am the Lord. P people will be watching this. And here's what's going to be going on. They'll be, they'll be sitting there in their TV, you know, watching on their phones, all kinds of devices. Israel being attacked as, we can, as we've seen videos and things even of today from October 7th. And they'll be going, oh my goodness, look at this. It's Russia. It's all these. They're coming to get Israel's toast. And everyone will see this miracle that will occur and they'll go, only God could do this. Amen. And this is what God says he will do. And, and the world is dialed in. The nations, it says, are, are, are watching. And, and God does this 
phenomenal, and they shall know that I'm the Lord in verse 1 of 39. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say thus to the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you on, bring you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. Old Testament imagery of warfare, which Ezekiel would have used. And you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, all your troops and the peoples who are with you. And I will give you to the birds of the prey, every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. God judges the military nations against Israel, And it says in verse 7, And I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more than the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. God wakes up the world because God may have taken Israel out of the land, but he did not, listen, he did not give the land to anyone else. It's still his land, and it's still Israel's land. And God says, I brought them back, and I'll protect them. He surely, it is coming, verse 8, and it shall be done, says the Lord. This is the day of which I have spoken. He says it'll happen. People say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's been thousands and thousands of years. It, okay, you argue with God. He says it will happen. Then those who dwell in the cities, verse 9, of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years, and they'll not have to take wood from the field. That whatever kind of, of, of equipment they have, whatever kind of weapons they're using, they'll use for energy and won't have to use their own. Every energy need will be met by the fuels of these weapons. And it says, and I will come to pass in verse 11 that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel. The valley of those who pass by the east of the sea, which most likely would be to the east, would be Jordan. And it will struck travelers. Most there they'll bury Gog and his multitude, and they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog, which means hordes or multitudes of Gog. The east side, the Dead Sea, is modern day Jordan. And the traffic and travel will be obstructed. And, and it tells us for seven months, over half a year, the house of Israel be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Maybe, maybe there's some resurgence of orthodoxy where they, 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 they want to cleanse the unclean dead bodies. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying and they will re gain renown for it on that day that I am glorified, verse 13 says the Lord. They, they will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land, verse 14, and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it, to get, it, get rid of the unclean. And at the end of seven months, they will make a final search. And the search party, verse 15, will pass through the land. If they even see a man's bone, he shall be set up a marker by it. Some say this is because of radiation. Who, who knows? But, but they're, they're cleansing the land. And the barriers will come, these special people, in the valley of Haman Gog. And the name of the city also will be Haman, and thus they shall cleanse the land. Now, God allows the animals in verse 17 through 20 to, to eat the flesh and drink the blood. And then in verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I've executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. It, it, all the nations will see what happens. And, and this could be in your lifetime. This could be in my lifetime. Pieces are in place. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. You'll know that I'm real. He's say, saying to Israel. And a lot of Israel, if you've ever been there, if you keep up with what goes on in Israel, the majority of Israel is not religious. It's very secular, it's very atheistic, it's very agnostic. Tel Aviv, I don't know if you know this or not, uh, probably one of the most liberal cities in the world. One of the largest LGBT movements in the, in the world is, is, is stationed in, in Tel Aviv, in Israel. Israel will see, they'll be awakened. 
scattered for over 2,000 years, now back in their land. This, 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 these pieces that are falling into place right now with all these different nations, perhaps Russia and, and Iran comes against them. And it tells us here in, in verse 23, the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of the enemies and they fell by the sword. And this happened, as I mentioned earlier, over 2,000 years they were scattered. But I, I would submit to you that God is not finished with Israel, but has moved them out of the land, not that they would never come back to the land, and it was never given over to anyone else. God had given it to Israel, and it still is God's land for the people of Israel. And he, and he says this in verse 25, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will bring back the captives of Jacob, have mercy on the whole house, and I will be jealous for my holy name. After they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, when they dwelt safely in their own land, and no one made them afraid. Just because I dealt with them, he still calls it their own land. And I believe this, and I think we can take this to the bank. No one is going to drive the Jewish people out of their land again. Amen. The slogan, from river to the sea, not going to happen. They're backed by God's sovereign will and power since May 14th, 1948, and I believe they're there till Jesus comes again. Amen. Verse 27, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them back out of their enemies' lands, and I'm hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to the land and left none of them captive any longer. I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God. Now, I don't think this is Armageddon. That's not yet. This is a stage, however, that is set for the Antichrist. Is it you? Someone say, well, is this before the rapture or after the rapture? I'm giving you the French salute on that. I don't know. It could be either. But this is, I think, on a precipice that could happen like never before. These nations coming together religiously and also Russia involved with Iran. We, we live right now in an amazing prophetic time. And things are not falling apart. They're falling in place. Amen. And we're watching it right before our eyes. Next, next week, I, I'm going to step out of talking about Israel. And I'm going to talk a little bit about as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And I would submit to you, you look around at our world, our nation, our culture, we live, and I don't know how much you know about the, the days of Noah. We live in Noahville. <laughs> we live in Noahville in so many different ways. And, and God judged that time radically. He said, I'll never do that again. But, but what was going on in the days of Noah is very similar to what's going on across the nation and in our nation today. So next week, signs of his coming as it was in the days of Noah. Today, kind of an overview of 38, 39, what God is doing in Israel and the different nations that have lined up, just as it says in Ezekiel. And, and I, I, I guess I can say this. Lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. You and I live in extremely prophetic, exciting times, and God is using prophecy, giving us prophecy, to be a filter to watch world events and news events that are happening right before our eyes. And they're happening in a way that you and I have never, ever, ever seen before. Amen?